Thank you everyone for joining us. We are so happy to have you here with us as we pivot MCSS Fest to this virtual event. First, I would like to thank our hosts and our sponsors, the University of Washington Smart Center and Kaiser Permanente and the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. My name is Joanna Brown and I am the School Climate um, Implementation Manager at OSPI and I will be your host for this session. Um, please share your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation and we will try to answer as many um, of your questions as we can. Um, we may stop um, at a predetermined stopping point during the presentation as well to take questions. Um, as a reminder, all participants are muted and no participants are on camera. It is my honor to welcome uh, Dr. Kathleen Strickland Cohen uh, to Virtual MTSS Fest. Um, she is um, an associate professor of research at the University of Oregon. And Dr. Strickland Cohen's work is supported by OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programs. Um, uh, funded National Center on PBIS. Her research focuses on the effective and sustained implementation of PBIS in schools with an emphasis on tier three behavior supports and family engagement within school-wide PBIS. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started and I'm going to stop my screen share. So um, Dr. Strickland Cohen, you can begin yours. I think you're mute, muted there. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Sorry, that sounds really, can you hear me now? <laughs> um, I don't have a mute on my screen, so it looks like I'm okay. Can you? Can you're good, we can hear you. Great, okay, thank you. One second, please. Um, let's see here. So it's um, very nice to be here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's also a little bit interesting to feel nervous about the number of people that are you're speaking to when you're sitting in your own home, but, <laughs> but we'll just roll with it. Um, so uh, like Joanna so kindly said, I am Kathleen Strickland Cohen. Um, my work prior to, to being at the university level was in public schools. I was a behavior specialist in schools for five years and had the, the privilege of working with um, my students, both in schools and in their home environments, um, which is one of the reasons that I am very interested in um, family professional partnership. So just wanted to give you a little bit of, of that background. Um, like Joanna said, I will, I do have sort of a natural stopping place where I'll be happy to stop and, and answer questions. But if you have questions as we're going, um, and there are more than a couple, we, we certainly, I certainly could be prompted to, to stop and and address those as we go. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we know that family engagement within schools has been strongly correlated with a number of different benefits um, to students. So things like improved academic engagement or academic outcomes, um, improved behavioral outcomes for students. Also the consistent implementation of behavioral interventions across settings. So, um, and I can, I can, like I said, from personal experience, not just from research, but also from just practical experience can say that, that having that kind of implementation across settings can really help not only with the um, success of behavior change strategies, but also with the, the maintenance of those strategies over time or that those behavior changes rather over time. Um, and also family engagement has been correlated with sustained implementation of school-wide systems of behavior support. So, not so much just showing up initially as, as part of initial implementation as, as being a factor that's really jumping out, but really when we're looking at sustained implementation over time, uh, family engagement or family involvement within the process is very important. So the agenda today, I wanna to talk about what is family engagement or what we mean by family engagement within schools. Also what we mean by family professional partnerships. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about the research on family engagement specifically within PBIS and some of the sort of gaps that we have and how our research has tried to address that. And I'm going to be talking about the results from two studies focused on parent perspectives within schools, implementing PBIS, and then also supporting family engagement. Um, and then I'll also within that be talking about a specific district's approach to over overcoming some of the barriers to family engagement within their program, uh, which is really cool. I don't take any credit for it, um, but it's amazing when, when we're able to see that the work that we're doing in schools is having an impact and, and to watch schools really take that information and, and build from that and the things that they're able to do um, to support families. So my goal for, for you all today is hopefully you will be able to leave here today with at least um, a few actionable steps that you and your team can implement to foster family engagement within your schools or districts um, that you're working with. And thinking about at least one specific strategy that you might use to better represent um, the voices or include the voices of families who are traditionally marginalized or underrepresented or whose voices are underrepresented when we're, we're doing this type of work. And Kathleen, I'm going to interrupt for just a moment, if I could. We have um, we have a question um, at, or a, a request to see if you could adjust your screen so um, we can see the slide that you're on um, one at a time, a little bit bigger, if that's possible. I think it probably is. Thank um, you. I just don't know how. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe this. I'm going to try. No, that didn't do it. Um, If you share from the other screen, share your other screen instead of the one that you're on, that should help. Let's see. Did that help at all? Or did that do anything? <laughs> that helped. That's great. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. And now it looks really weird on my end, but that's okay. We're just going to keep rolling. <laughs> I don't know exactly what I did, but that's cool. Um, okay, so I might be looking over here some, so I apologize for that. So uh, family involvement in schools um, traditionally has focused more on um, involvement as opposed to engagement. So thinking about those as two different things. So traditionally family involvement in schools has been primarily understood by both parents and staff as family members being actively present in the school building. So thinking about activities like volunteering in a school, attending school events, PTA, um, meet the teacher, that kind of thing. Um, and strategies have been mostly aimed at increasing parent engagement by either Again, having school uh, parents come to the school directly or um, having families be sort of passive recipients of information. So some of that could be by coming to those types of events. Um, others might just be information that we're sort of sending home to families with less of a focus on sort of a more two-way or reciprocal type of communication. And possibly right now, um, more than ever, we want to be thinking about parent engagement rather than parent involvement. Um, so parent engagement from more of this perspective of a multifaceted kind of lens where we're thinking about it a little more broadly. Participation in schools and school-sponsored activities, of course, being very important. But for a number of families, that's just not possible for a lot of different reasons. Um, there are a lot of different barriers that prevent that from happening. So also thinking about parent engagement as being communicating or families communicating with teachers about their children, so again, thinking about that sort of reciprocal interaction that's going on. Um, engaging in educationally stimulating activities and reinforcing learning at home, that can also be, think, be thought of as parent engagement. Um, parent enforced expectation around um, school and education and thinking about how parents are supporting what's going on in school and how they're supporting their students to be successful in that way, or their children rather communication with their children about school and education. So this also includes sort of families and parents um, values related to education and aspirations for their children's education and how families are 
um, sort of supporting that and also conveying those values and goals to their children. So all of those pieces could be thought of as parent engagement. I really like this particular definition also of family engagement. So looking at the way that the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Ed talk about family engagement in schools, um, family engagement referring to the systematic inclusion of families in the planning, development, and evaluation of activities and programs that promote children's development and learning, and also specifying that we want parental and, and families' involvement um, also in activities, not only in activities, but also in programs and systems. Of course, that links very well to, to what we are talking about. So um, I'm not going to belabor the point and assume that anyone here doesn't know what this triangle represents, um, but when we're thinking about school-wide PBIS and multitude systems of behavior support, um, a defining feature is the inclusion of relevant stakeholders, and that includes families in the design and implementation of the practices and systems that we're using within our schools. We also know that an important focus of PBIS in particular is this focus on prevention. So thinking about early intervention with, with students um, that may have problem behavior. When I think about early intervention, of course, I'm not just talking about young children, I'm also talking about intervening early. So thinking about addressing um, problem behavior when it first starts. So being able to um, identify students that are having challenges really quickly and also intervening in, in a way that we're not waiting for things to sort of get worse before we put our most effective practices in place. And it's because of that that um, my colleague and I are going to see my colleague Kathleen Kaiser's name in this pre presentation a lot. She and I work together. Her, her, um, her focus is on family professional partnerships specifically, whereas my background is more in behavior support in schools. So we, we sort of teamed up for this work. Um, so school-wide PBIS and families, um, this approach is uniquely suited, we think, to leveraging partnership within um, schools and leveraging that family professional partnership to support early remediation of challenging behavior. So not waiting until there are issues or problems, but actually thinking about how can we support students that are engaging in sort of low levels of challenging behavior. But we know that the research within school um, PBIS has really um, not focused primarily on students that have these less intensive behavioral challenges. So most of what we know about how to effectively partner with families within this approach, and actually even within the larger field, focuses around students that have more significant needs. So students who are engaging in more intense types of challenging behaviors, students with, for example, um, tier three behavior support needs. Uh, we know a lot more about how to effectively uh, partner with families of students with more intensive needs than we do students that have less intensive behavioral challenges. So what the research tells us is that engaging with families around tiers two and three typically, or most often anyway, looks like school to home communication. So school to home communication in written form often times to so think about, you know, daily communicators that might go home um, for all students or um, thinking about something like check in, check out, and a parent being able to, our, our family members being able to, to get something on a regular basis that is something that the school is communicating. Oftentimes there may be a signature that's involved and then that might be sent back, but in terms of that being a true reciprocal sort of two-way interaction is, is rare. So we know that those are very efficient ways to communicate, which makes sense because we're talking about a large portion or a large percentage of our schools. Um, but they're not very effective in, in terms of overcoming some of the barriers that we know exist related to family um, professional partnership or, partnership or family engagement in schools. Sorry. So um, I wanna talk today about one of the studies that we conducted specifically focusing on exploring the ways in which existing family teacher communication practices within schools implementing school-wide PBIS either facilitate or hinder families' abilities to partner with their children's teachers. So we were looking specifically at examining the experiences that parents were reporting um, 
specifically parents of students with tier one and or tier two behavior support needs. This would usually be the time that I would say something about, it may seem odd to talk about behavior support needs of students with tier one or with tier one needs because students at tier one don't engage in challenging behavior and that's when everyone would laugh a little bit. So, because <laughs> we know that's not true. <laughs> so, um, we also want to make sure that you understand that we're talking about this from a family professional partnership lens. So family professional partnership um, sort of even going a bit beyond or a step beyond just thinking about engagement. So somebody is raising their hand, um, I think. Do I need to pause a sec? Keep going. Okay, let me keep going. So. Um, thinking about family professional partnership, we're really wanting to focus on involving this sort of two-way communication between families and educators to agree on building on each other's expertise. So it's not a teacher as expert model, it's more of a us coming together and using what we both know about this particular child to help that student be most successful. Some defining features of partnership are families being treated with equality and respect, shared decision-making and determination of goals and valued outcomes, forming alliances with families to create win-win solutions. So solutions that not only benefit the student, but also that benefit the, the overall classroom context and even the families when possible. Um, parents and teachers' strength-based collaborations are really focusing on students' strengths. And then strong communication practices are, are sort of the cornerstone of what we think of as being effective parent and, and teacher partnerships. So strong communication practices that attend to both the quality and the quantity of the communication. So it's not always just about how quickly or, or um, how often they're talking but, um, or communicating, but also what's the, what's the content of that and how well are, are those relationships being established. I'm just gonna check on the time for myself here. Okay, so our setting, when we were looking at this particular question, we were talking to family members and teachers from three elementary schools in a large urban school district in Texas that were implementing uh, school-wide PBIS. And we were looking at strategies for, again, supporting um, tiers one and two. So these were the things that I'm about to describe. These were the pieces that the school already had in place, or I'm not sorry, school, the district already had in place. Um, and then therefore all three of these schools were doing these pieces. So they already had daily school to home communication forms for all students um, in these elementary schools. Um, they were including family member representatives when developing school wide expectations. That's something that they had already done as part of their PBIS programming. Provided information about PBIS and behavioral expectations during the beginning of the school year orientations and meet the teacher or family nights. And then including PBIS information as a formal part of the process for registering new students. So as new students come in, there were part that was formally part of their process was to talk to families at that point about PBIS and also introduce the students to PBIS at that point. So that's a bit about what they were already doing. Um, so we did talk to both teachers and family members. Like I said, we talked to, ten, uh, this was a fo focus group study. So we talked with 27 teachers in different focus groups. Um, 28 family members, so family members of students that had tier one behavior support needs, and then also family members of students that had tier two behavior support needs. Um, so we were doing this again across the three different schools. So there were nine focus groups total. Our, fo our focus today though, when I talk through the data are really going to focus specifically on, on the family member data. It's a lot, it, it's a lot of data um, to talk about. So we're going to focus primarily on the family member data, although I may bring up a little bit of, of the educator data when we get a little bit later um, into the talk. So the specific questions that we were really interested in, in asking the families were what experience or events do family members perceive as having helped or hindered communication with teachers? related to their child's behavior specifically. So when we asked these questions of the family members, we made it clear that we weren't just talking when we say behavior, we don't mean a dirty word, right? We're talking about all behavior. So it could also be a, the conversations that they'd had about supporting appropriate behavior, um, 
it could even include some some aspects of helping students that are engaging in problem behavior that also have academic needs. So it could include those types of conversations as well. And then also we wanted to know what ideas do family members wish that they could express to their teachers, um, their child's teachers about supporting their child's appropriate behavior and addressing any problem behaviors that their child may exhibit. So if they had something that they wish that they could communicate to their, their child's teacher, what would those things be? What would those particular ideas be? So I wanna talk a little bit about the data and what we found. Um, we went through these multiple scripts of, I'm sorry, uh, transcripts of, of all these meetings. Um, they were audio recorded. Uh, we were there and present and we were taking notes, but they were audio recorded so we could go back and, and do a deeper dive. Um, so we were looking at the helping factors specifically that the family members talked about. Um, so the top two were um, working toward a common goal and 29% of those critical incidents or, or ideas in this category focused on the use of a common language to describe behavior and behavioral expectations. So it was nice to sort of hear that um, discussed. We did not, our question again, as you saw, it was very open-ended. So we were not prompting families to talk specifically about behavioral expectations in that way, but that was something that came out over and over again. Um, also positive feedback from teachers are hearing good things about what, what their children are doing, not just sort of being told what's going wrong was very important. Um, other things that were mentioned, active parent engagement in school. So some of the families brought up, our family members brought up that they were um, volunteering at times or they were able to connect with their, their child's teacher during drop off or pick up, that kind of thing. Um, regular teacher communication about student behavior was another that was really important. Again, keeping in mind that that these families were getting some form of communication from their teacher or their child's teacher every single day. Um, having multiple modes of two-way communication was a big one. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, teachers being open to parent suggestions. So that was one that was brought up. And then even though it wasn't as, as big of a category, I really was happy to see this final one, which was um, the category was positive feedback to teachers from family members. So I thought that was really important that, that the, um, the family members brought up, not only did they see the importance of hearing positive things from their child's teacher, but they also thought it was very important that they provide positive feedback to their child's teacher in order to, to establish and um, foster that relationship. So here was an actual quote from one of the family members that specifically was related to addressing common language. Um, I don't really want to read this to you all and hopefully it's big enough on your screen. Um, I'll just give you a moment to read this. So essentially what this quote is, is um, describing is that the parent understands or at least has heard what the, the school-wide expectations are and, and this parent is, is trying to um, use that information to talk to their child about the fact that you are not responsible for anyone else's behavior, not what they say, not what they do. Let's talk about responsibility and, and talking about responsibility within the home and what that means. So um, that, that was a good example we felt of that sort of common language that was being used across home and school. So here were the hindering categories. And again, these weren't, um, these represent sort of combinations of a lot of different ideas and we categorized those ideas into different categories. Um, so the hindering categories that came out were a lack of timely information about problem behavior. So again, these are factors that inhibit the relationship between families or the partnership between families and teachers or at least the perceived uh, factors that inhibit that. So lack of timely information about problem behavior. 33% of the ideas within this category described events that were directly related to a lack of timely information about issues at school that prevented family members from being able to appropriately address student behavior at home. So um, here's a quote from that. So he acts out at school or how he acts at school determines what's going to happen when he comes home. How can I address problem behavior if I don't know about it? So that was an example of an idea that would have 
fallen into that category. And then differing expectations and philosophy about behavior support. So this was another thing that came up quite often. Um, maybe speaks a little bit to the importance of not only talking to families about what behavioral expectations are, but also why we find the, the positive approach to be more effective and um, why we have that lens, as opposed to sort of, you know, some of the comments, for example, it's not stated here, but they were more around, you know, I think that my child just needs harsher punishment. That may not be the exact words, but that was what was being conveyed. Um, so uh, a lack of guidance on how to support appropriate student behavior, that was something else that came out that families were asking for, saying was a hindering factor. And then also educator focus on negative behavior. So we would anticipate that. So obviously, as we know, if most of my interactions with anyone are, are centering on problem behavior, um, that doesn't help to, to form a strong relationship. And then finally, here are the data related to the wish list items. Um, so when we talk to family members and we ask them that question again about if there are things that you wish that you could um, express to your child's teacher, um, I, should, I should go back and say that we, that we were doing this, um, we did the, these focus groups midway through the year, but when we talked to the, the families, we didn't say you have to stipulate on the student or your, your child's teacher from this year. It can be a child a teacher that your child has had um, throughout their educational career. You're just thinking about specific instances that have occurred. Um, we did ask them to keep it within the last three years. So wish list items, um, some important pieces were that they wanted, family members wanted to convey to their child's teacher that they were on the same team or they saw it themselves as being part of a team with the teachers. Um, to focus on students' strengths, I thought that this was a really important point. So here was an example of, of um, a parent's um, quote that they, they gave. So for my own child, she's a talker. So for her teachers, I wish, um, or would like to see the teachers use that to foster po positive interactions. Instead of always disciplining her for talking too much, give her a reading assignment maybe that she could read out loud to other students. So take what you have issues with and show her a positive way to use it. So that was a great example of um, the kinds of quotes that we were, were seeing and hearing or hearing and reading, I guess in this case, um, related to focusing on students' strengths. Trust as being critical, that was something that came up over and over again, the importance um, and the value of trust in this relationship. And also getting to know and treat students as individuals. So um, that was something that came up a lot when, when thinking about what they wish they could express, just make sure that you really understand my child. That was an, an, an idea that came out. Dr. Strickland Cohan, we do have a question specific to the study that you've been discussing. Yeah. Um, the question is, was the data um, also desegregated by race um, in any way? For example, um, did you find that um, families of certain um, ethnic subgroups um, were considered more engaged with schools or teachers and same with the hindering factors? No, we didn't, we didn't desegregate. Okay. Um, it was a fairly small sample. So we weren't looking for, this was, a, I should have said before, this was a qualitative study. So we weren't trying to take this information and generalize that to a broader sort of context. We really were just focusing on the particular families that we were talking about. We do have demographic data um, about, about race and ethnicity, um, but we did, not, we did not disaggregate the data in that way. So um, to talk about this in terms of sort of what we saw from a bigger picture perspective, so the evidence of district commitment to PBIS and families, obviously that was pretty strong or we, we felt that was strong, strongly sort of conveyed. Um, we heard a number of reports of effective partner, partnership practices, the use of common language across home and schools, parents and teachers working as a team toward common behavioral goals, and family members receiving positive feedback about their children's behavior from teachers and administrators.
So part of what we were, um, obviously when we're working with schools doing research, we wanna make sure that we're, we're giving back as well. So um, we did take these data back to the school and talk to them about the fact that obviously this was a small, relatively small group um, of, of parents and, and teachers that we were talking with, but we did have some, some sort of general outcomes that we wanted to point out to them and also some recommendations. So I'm gonna be talking about those outcomes and recommendations at this point, and then also um, how the school sort of ran with those recommendations and were able the next school year to really implement some things that were pretty cool um, for thinking about how to, to talk about the, um, to talk with families about challenging behavior, and then also just to include families more in their PBIS process. So like I said, they really sort of ran with this and made this a much um, sort of bigger action item as, as part of their teaming um, process within their school. I'm schools and district. I keep saying school, but there were three different schools in the district that we were working with. So, um, so the outcome in terms of systems for homeschool communication, we of course commended the campus uh, campuses for having a systematic process for homeschool communication on a daily basis. That's pretty outstanding that they were doing that already. Um, but it was important to note to the folks that we were talking to in the schools that there were some, some issues around the need for consistency and using the system. The importance of timely information about problem behavior like I talked about earlier was a barrier um, and some clarity related to you know how much information should be included in those um, types of of communications about problem behavior and how quickly um, so for example when i gave that quote earlier saying that if we don't know what's going on you know thinking about getting a frowny face for example home doesn't necessarily give you enough information to sort of build on that so um, that was something that we shared. The importance of having multiple modes of communication. This, this was something that came out particularly for students um, or the families of students who had who have tier two behavior support needs. So um, thinking about different ways of communicating with families so that it's not necessarily just a written format. Um, and particularly for students who may need to, or for families who may need additional kinds of con uh, contact more regularly for example, students that have more intensive or, or um, tier two behavior support needs. So the importance of having those sort of other ways of accessing and having two-way reciprocal conversations was very important. So some of the recommendations that we gave were to create some decision rules around how to systematize when to provide that additional information um, and when they should be taking additional steps in terms of having that daily communicator being a good thing for all families, but then when do you need to be doing more and having some decision rules around that for contacting families in particular, um, whose students are, um, whose children are engaging in, in more consistent patterns of problem behavior. And then communicating those policies and procedures to families in writing at the beginning of the school year so they can understand sort of what to anticipate and expect and reduce any type of confusion. Um, so for students who require beyond tier one support, that's what we were talking, I was just talking about. So particularly for those students, maybe um, talking with parents as the, the year goes on around, you know, we're going to be providing additional support, or if you know that you're getting students who do have additional needs, talking to those families and saying, you know, these are the ways that we're going to communicate on a regular basis, but are there other ways that it would be helpful for us to know? So some of our families said emails were great. Some said they text with their, child's teacher or have an app that allows them to do something similar to texting. Um, so those became very important. So um, the outcome around family awareness of PBIS, this, is, this was what we were discussing in terms of there being sort of that mismatch between um, family and teachers member, or family members and teachers philosophies related to how to address problem behavior. Um, and this I kind of alluded to earlier. So several participating family members expressed the belief that PBIS only focuses on positives um, and limits their ability to contemplate problem behavior. So that's to me indicated or to us indicated either a lack of understanding of the PBIS framework or sort of a, a lack of buy-in or understanding of, of why we're doing what we're doing. So um, I, I did discuss this, sorry, the slides kind of, so I did discuss this earlier um, in thinking about when sharing information with families, really talking about the 
understand the importance of this preventative approach and talking about the importance of a positive approach and why that's important. Um, so that it's not, again, it's not just sort of saying, here are the expectations and this is what we're doing, but really providing a rationale behind why um, we're doing what we're doing. So um, some of the things that we, again, commended them on that they're already doing, we, we recommended that they continue to share information at the beginning of the school year in writing and in person whenever possible. Um, as part of the new student registration, that was a great idea that they were already doing. And then we recommended that at least two additional times during the school year having organized family events or figuring out ways to do that. Um, so this was, um, so one of their action steps, they were um, focused on increasing family awareness. So something that they decided to do on their own was to discuss PBIS initiatives during family engagement nights, PTA meetings, and they also added a newsletter that they were sending home quarterly. Um, they added some information sessions specifically focused on PBIS in the home to their family nights. And then also sort of, I thought they had um, this table, almost like a little expo table that they, they had set up during other types of family events so that families could stop by and find out more information, for example, at the school, um, find out more information about their PBIS program and what that looked like. I kind of want to stop and see if anyone is asking questions at this point. I just feel like I'm <laughs> the nature of this is that I'm talking an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a couple of questions. Um, let's see. Um, one is um, back to the research um, a specific question, uh, it being focused on elementary schools. Um, is there other research that is there out there to support? these and additional strategies at the secondary level? Actually, there aren't that I know of, um, not specifically within the PBIS literature. Um, although someone else out there in this big audience might chime in and say, yes, there are. Um, but we, we haven't, we were unable to find studies that were looking at supporting family engagements within tiers one and two specifically um, at the time that we were doing this study, which was a couple of years ago. So, it could be that new things have come out that I'm not aware of, but I'm not currently aware of schools. I mean, a similar work that's being done at the secondary level. Okay, and we have um, two questions that are sort of similar in topic. Um, Harmony asks, um, can you speak to how the teachers managed the regular communication strategy that existed in the school prior to the beginning of the study? Um, and another, uh, Jill asks, what did uh, the daily communication look like? Okay, those are, they do seem very similar, so I'll, I'll try my best to answer those. So um, it was, like I, I kind of alluded to, it was just a written form, a daily communication form, and it, it for all students, it, it pretty much did boil down to, like, was it a good day? Was it a not so good day? If it wasn't a good day, then there was a place to write a brief note indicating what was the issue. Um, and that was a form that would go home every day with the child in their homework folder. And the, it was an opportunity because the parents were already looking um, or family members were already looking at the homework folder or signing off on the homework folder. That was an opportunity for them to then look and see, you know, how did the day go in general? So it was a written communication form. All right, we do have a few more certainly keep moving on and then um, maybe stop in a little bit after a few more slides or if yeah so I'm, I'm going to take a break here in just a, a couple minutes after I get through this part and we can ask um, we can we can make time to add, answer some questions then before we move into the, the next study so um, a primary limitation like I said this was a it was a qualitative study and we weren't necessarily looking for a complete rep representative sample for that reason, but um, we wanted to, to point out that a limitation of this study is definitely that it only included the voices of parents who were able, so had the resources, availability, willingness, all those, all those pieces um, to participate in the after-school focus group meetings. So we did hold the focus group meetings after school, um, except with, with the exception of one of the elementary schools because the family members actually said they preferred to do that the, the meeting a little bit earlier in the day. Um, 
So the school helped us to, um, the family uh, liaison at these schools, they were, they were all Title I schools, so they had a, a family liaison. Um, so the family liaison helped us to identify families who were interested, and in one school they did want to come during the school day. Um, but the other two, one was right after school, so like around 3.45, and, and one was later in the evening around, around 5. Um, so a significant limitation, though, is that, is that we were only able to talk to a small group of families, which obviously we know does not necessarily represent the beliefs or opinions of all families um, in those schools, and also does not necessarily um, represent the opinions of groups who are already probably underrepresented in our understanding of effective practices for family professional partnership. So that's definitely a limitation of the study. Um, so our recommendation based on that to, to the schools that we were working with and to the district um, was to think about school-based activities because of, initially when we were working with them, they were largely thinking about this from a school-based perspective in terms of bringing families in. So creating welcoming spaces, of course, is important, um, providing opportunities for parents to network within those spaces. So um, that can be something that can be helpful. Allowing for multiple discussion formats because there are a number of people who aren't necessarily going to be uh, willing to speak out. Um, personal invitations to school events. So this was something that some of the teachers um, mentioned as well, that they noticed that when they were able to catch families um, either before or after school and, and or make phone calls and invite them personally to events, that that was very helpful, um, more so than just sending out sort of mass emails or flyers. Um, also to partner, we recommended that they partner more with their family engagement liaisons and or family engagement campus representatives to identify strategies for reaching and getting um, feedback from all families across the district. So they had, this was a large urban district. Um, like I said, they had quite a few resources um, in their family's office. And so part of that was working with the family's office to make sure that, that the schools knew sort of what types of supports the family office could, um, could provide and then how they could best partner with the schools. Um, this was just one of the ideas that one of the schools um, had and also pulled off. So they had a family movie night, um, a way to connect families. Um, this was a, a great idea. So uh, the teachers and staff also brought their families and they all met at the football field <laughs> and they served dinner and um, the trainers, I'm sorry, the teachers and coaches actually were the ones that, that cooked everything. And um, yeah, so they all came and they watched a movie together. Um, on a big screen on the football field. So um, that was a good opportunity for families um, to sort of network and talk. And they did have a short presentation, but it was mostly just an opportunity to get to know the families and to provide some information. So in terms of their action steps, and again, this is, this what, these were not our ideas. These were just ways that the district sort of built on what we were talking about. So. Um, in terms of accessing underrepresented voices, um, administrators and district leaders consider increasing their community presence with an, emphasis, with an emphasis on going to families. So that was something that we did say, or we did talk about with them, is like how could we not only identify ways to get families to come to us, but how do we go to them in a number of different ways? And that may be in person, that may be through the use of technology, but how are we, how are we going to families? Um, so they were already having coffee with the principal or superintendent several times throughout the year. Um, they were already doing that in their schools. And so the way that they addressed that the, the following year was that they actually started going out into the community. So several times throughout the year in various locations at different times of the day were when these events were occurring as opposed to just coming to the school or having families come to school um, to increase the likelihood that more parents would attend and provide feedback. So again, sort of, large spread out urban area, having, having um, the, the principals and superintendents go out into the community and offer opportunities to meet with families in that way. Um, perhaps a little easier to get to. Um, they were having those events not just during the school day or not just during in the morning. I think that initially it was like coffee and donuts with the principal, but obviously we know that not a lot of families can, um, or family members can come to the school at that time of the day. So offering opportunities to do that in the evening um, 
on the weekends. So that brings me to this point. So they also um, started having activities such as this throughout the year. So this was a really cool activity that they had or idea that they had to have um, this cookout. Um, and they did this more than once throughout the year, but this was the one that they had. These are pictures from the one that they had at the beginning of the year, but teachers and staff, these are just quotes from teachers and staff. So teachers and staff met our kids where they do life every day and had the best time. Free hot dogs, books, school supplies, and love. So that was a good comment. Um, so actually, this was a, a complex or an apartment complex where a number of their kiddos lived. Um, and so inviting the families and, and kids out for an afternoon to, to have a meal together and play games um, and just get to know one another. That was something that they initiated three different times during, out, during that school year. Um, porch visits were specific to the beginning of the school year. So in August, going around to um, meet different kiddos at their homes um, before school started. So as a way of getting to know the students and their, their parents. And then this was another way that they were using, um, and I'm, we're all very familiar with this type of technology now probably, but um, a couple of years ago, it was relatively new for, for um, schools to be sort of using technology in this way. So this was some examples of administrators and teachers who were meeting with the students more regularly and families um, via Facebook. Okay, so this, this is a good time before we keep moving um, to, to ask or answer a few questions and we'll sort of see where, I might have to run through the next part pretty quickly, but, but we'll go from where we're at. Okay, do you wanna read through the questions, Dr. Circle and Cohen, or do you want me to, to read you some? I'm actually not seeing them at this point. Okay. And huh. Okay, well, I'm happy to, there's a question from Amber. Um, she says, this is an amazing idea to engage parents right now for planning for next year. Thank you for sharing. The feedback that was provided, did you have fill in the blank options or ranking order options? What platform did the survey go out in? Oh, the, the, the survey that we were, um, the, the information that we got from families, I guess is what's being asked. I think so, yeah. Yes, okay, so that was, those were focus group meetings. So we actually were just talking directly to families um, and teachers. And um, so we, we just did audio recorded, we asked questions and then went around the room and audio recorded all the ideas that everyone was, was um, sharing out. And then we took those audio recordings and we had all of that transcribed so that we as researchers could go through and, and find the specific unique ideas that were part of those. Okay, thank you. And Harmony is wondering if there will be a follow-up study after implementation of the suggestions. Unfortunately, um, that was back when I was working in Texas and now I'm in Oregon. Um, I have, I definitely continue to stay in touch with this district. So if they were, or if they were at all interested, um, I would love to do a follow-up study with them, um, but it might be a little challenging because of just the distance. Okay, would you like a couple more? Or you sure. let me know, okay, sure. Um, so Jen, Jen writes, um, so many families have experienced the phenomena around schools implementing initiatives and then informing families that this is what will ha what is happening. This contributes to the disempowerment of families, especially those who have and continue to be marginalized. Is there something from your lens or from the research that speaks to the importance of engaging families and communities before PBIS or other initiatives happen at the building or district level? I think that there's certainly um, plenty of sort of, I hate to say it this way, but there's, there's lots of sort of theoretical literature out there saying that that we need to be to be including families when we're thinking about not only um, sort of again like you're saying like how to get the word out but it's more about including family voice when you're actually developing systems and programs so I think that that's something that we definitely need to be focused on um, I don't know that there is a lot of work around how that's actually playing out or being executed um, 
but that's a good question for me in terms of looking into that. So um, whoever wrote that question, I'm going to be putting my um, email address up in a bit and you're, you're welcome to email me that question and we can think on that together. Okay. Would you like one more or would you like to save some time at the end? We'll save some time at the end. I'd like to see how quickly I can move through this next piece. Um, and we'll see what I get what I get to. I'm, I'm just going to move really quickly through this and I'll try to save. Um, I'll try to get through this next piece in the next five minutes and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Hopefully that will work. Um, so this will be again, I'm not I'm not going to have time to go into this very deeply, but I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about the fact that we did take some of this information that we found to move into a different type of study um, where we were looking at uh, building a strategy for helping families and te uh, family members and teachers to communicate around more specific types of behavioral challenges. So for students who are struggling to meet classroom expectations. So we, we developed a strategy and a meeting form that allowed them to meet, um, to start with um, sort of talking through and identifying what the student's strengths are defining behavioral expectations both in the home and at school. So the whole purpose of this process um, is really just to give the, the teacher and the family members an opportunity to talk with one another, not necessarily to, to say we agree on what this expectation is, but more for them to hear each other in discussing those pieces. Um, again, this would be for students that do have more um, problem behavior that's a bit more persistent that they're actually trying to address. Um, more from a reciprocal, both across home and school lens. So um, identifying common goals and connecting with students' strengths, um, identifying and agreeing, agreeing on behavior support strategies, again, not necessarily the exact same strategy across home and school, but working together to identify a strategy where they're working toward a common goal. And then planning for follow-up communication. So the main reason that I'm bringing up this strategy is that I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go into this too deeply, but um, I'm going to put my email address up, like I said, um, in a minute, and, and I want you all to feel free to sort of bug me about this if you want to um, and ask for more information, and I'm happy to share with you um, if you do. So um, basically what we know at this point, we've done some preliminary testing of this, and what we know at this point is that family, uh, family members and teachers are able to use this strategy uh, that's the strategy that that we developed um, that teachers are able to implement this effectively because we were we did some video recording of families and teachers meeting so we met with with teachers um, to conduct this sort of uh, training for them in about 90 minutes and um, from there we were able to video uh, the parents and teachers meeting together and I and we were able to um, see that the teachers were able to implement the strategy, uh, like I said, with very minimal training, and also that they found it to be effective and um, that they liked it. So basically it was perceived as socially valid. So thinking about in terms of acceptability and usability and feasibility, these were all things that, that both parents, when we interviewed them afterwards, both parents and, and um, sorry, family members and teachers both felt that, that this strategy was, um, acceptable and feasible for use in the classroom. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll um, again, just thinking about the time, um, I'll sort of just sum things up now. So um, in summary, there are a variety of ways that we can increase family engagement within the district um, and schools that we're working in. PBIS can be a vehicle for improving those relationships and engaging families. Identifying strategies for engaging families who are underrepresented and who experience barriers is something that we always want to be keeping in mind. And then contact me if you <laughs> if you want to know more about PBB. So apparently I, um, I anticipated that I was going to run out of time. So I'll put up my email address and then um, we have time for questions. Okay. Um, we have a question about um, from Jerry she, um, about early interventions. How do you make early interventions practical and motivate schools to do it in a system that relies on data to prove significant educational impact for a student to become eligible for interventions, especially given limit, limited resources? 
I'm not, I'm not sure that I completely understand the question. Can you read it again? Sure. How do you make early intervention practical and motivate schools to do it in a system that relies on data to prove significant educational impact for a student to become eligible for interventions, especially when given limited resources? Gotcha. So early intervention in this case, I'm understanding. Um, how do we focus on early intervention or intervening early rather um, when we need data to support that the student needs more intensive intervention? Um, I think that this is really about, I think this is the whole message of PBIS. I mean, I really think that this is about sort of that cultural shift that has to occur in schools where we understand, first of all, that, that it's not just students that need training at the tier one level. It's, it's also our, our teaching staff that need to understand why we're doing this and why it's so important and to have really um, systematic and effective ways for teaching tier one expectations and for identifying students that need more support um, so that it's, you know, that we have our systems in place at tier one strong, strongly enough um, implemented within our schools that we can quickly identify students that are not responding to tier one support. Um, and then, and then we start by looking at tier two support. I think, if, I think that's what you're asking. Um, because that, you know, our tier two support is one of the most important features of providing tier two support is that it's something that we can identify that students need quickly and that we can get it in place within a week. So hopefully you have systems in place within your school where that's a, at the tier two level is some, a place where students can sort of enter and, and become, um, I'm sorry, start receiving that level of intervention very quickly. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few more. Um, so based on your research uh, with this particular district and your knowledge and expertise, what is a suggestion that teachers across the country um, can do to support families during this time of crisis? Yeah, this, and then bringing, <laughs> bringing this into, I should have said earlier, obviously all, this, all of this research was done prior to. Um, I think it's, it's pretty applicable though and still in thinking about ways to ways to build relationships with families. I mean, if you look at the results that we, that we talked through, thinking about how do you strengthen those relationships with families can be important, even if you're doing it um, via distance. However, I think right now, um, I think right now, again, thinking about family engagement and how family engagement is this sort of multifaceted Thing. And it's not necessarily about us just providing families with resources and saying, you know, you need to be doing this and how can we support you in doing this particular thing that we want you to do um, versus looking at families as um, or family relationships with us as a partnership where we're trying to identify sort of what are some of the barriers that our families are experiencing right now and and basically providing families with what I kind of think of as almost like PBIS for families or tiered supports for families. Um, there are going to be some families right now that really are looking for, you know, how can I create a structured day for my child and, and what are the strategies that I need to put into place and how can I um, deliver these lessons that I want to do. There are going to be some families that are going to be at that level, but there's other families that they're really just sort of hanging on by a thread right now. Um, and so, you know, thinking about those families as just presenting things in a way that you're saying, here are ways that we can be supportive, um, but not sort of forcing that on families and saying, these are the things that we need you to do. I don't know if that's a very good answer, but that's how I think about it. That was great, thank you. Um, I am noticing we are getting close to the end of our scheduled time together. Um, we've had a, a, a few requests to stay on for a few minutes for Q&A, um, which we are allowed to do. It's, it's up to you if you'd like to take a few more questions or we can have folks email you directly um, for questions or um, we have the CISL address as, email address as well. I'm happy to stay over a few more minutes. 
Okay, Thanks, great. And it, it sounds like, um, it, would it be possible to put the, um, the positive um, behavior partnership form um, in the documents with your slide deck? It's still is, in development, so I hesitate to put it out broadly, but if someone wants to contact me directly, they can. Sounds good, thank you. Um, so let's see, we have, um, we've had a couple of questions um, about ideas specific for middle school and high school. Um, and let's see, there is one question that I was going to answer live, scrolling up. Um, Rachel says, or asks, our, our school struggles with family communication. Most families want phone calls or emails and teachers are, are finding it overwhelming to contact a list of parents each day. How do we stay in contact with families with their preferred method and not overload our teachers? We also include other adults in the building. Do you recommend weekly communication? I, I definitely think that you kind of have to, and again, I'm, I'm actually not speaking to this particular point in history. Um, I'm speaking more to how I'm, I'm used to, to um, working with schools and, and districts more face to face. Um, but I think that we have to sort of, again, thinking about the tiered system, um, we did not recommend when we were talking to schools that they try to identify parents' preferred mode of communication for every family in their classroom because I just think that that's infeasible. Um, I think that when we have, I mean, it sounds wonderful, it's great, <laughs> it would be a good thing to do, but it, it does sound completely infeasible oftentimes. So I think that when we have family members of students that do have more significant needs, that's the time that we really want to focus on identifying the best way to communicate with those families. Um, I think that if for all of your students, if you're able to to provide some kind of weekly communication, that would be great. I think that would be something that would be definitely worth aiming for. Um, and that could be, again, speaking of that tiered system, that could be um, something that would be a little less intensive, like a written communication or, or something of that nature. Or um, some of the, the teachers that I've been working with are using apps where they're sending out almost like a weekly newsletter that, that um, is for all families within the classroom of sort of this is what we did this week and or this is what we're planning to do for the week. Um, so it would be a weekly communication for all families in mass. And then again, having those more specific communications being tailored to families that have students that do have more intensive needs. And then also having some opportunities or ideas to brainstorm with your groups there within your schools to think about how can at least during the year you periodically check in with families of students um, that are doing quite well, but just to make sure that you're continuing to build those relationships. But those might be sort of, you know, random check-ins with families so that you're making sure that you're sort of touching base with everyone. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Uh, Strickland Cohen. I, we really appreciate, on behalf of OSPI, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and um, and pivoting to this online format in a short amount of time. Um, yeah. up, on this, up on the screen, I did copy and paste your email address, um, larger at the bottom. I also, at the top, it, um, you can also send questions to uh, CISL, um, CISL at k12.wa.us, and those will go to, we'll make sure that those questions get answered um, as well. Um, again, the session will be available on or around May 4th, um, and we'll make sure that um, your slides get uh, posted um, on the website as well. And um, again, thank you on behalf of OSPI. Thank you, participants, and thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>